Good afternoon. We can resume with parliamentary business now. And first question, we turn to portfolio questions on communities, social security and equalities. Question number one from Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government how many people in Mid Scotland and Fife are in receipt of support from the Scottish Welfare Fund. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, before I answer Ms Baker's question, I'd ask everyone to bear with me this afternoon because uh, I'll be answering all of the questions on, part, um, on the behalf of the portfolio. Uh, in response to Ms Baker, the latest statistics published on 24th of April show that for the period covering 1st of October 2017 to 31st of December 2017, 5,955 people in Mid Scotland and Fife received one or more crisis grants and community care grants from the Scottish Welfare Fund, totalling £795,328. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for that response. The Minister might be aware that official figures show the successful Tier 1 reviews, i.e. the appeals, for both community care grants and crisis grants sits around 50%. Following a recent visit to a food bank in my region, it was suggested to me that the staff administering the fund are working under significant pressure, leading to potentially successful applications being initially denied before then being overturned on review. Does the Minister agree that such a high appeal rate, while showing that the review system is working, may also indicate problems at the initial application stage? What assurances is able to give that my constituents that sufficient resources are in place for staff to deal thoroughly with the applications in the first instance? Minister. Um, I thank Ms Baker for that question and I know that um, Ms Freeman was keeping a very close eye uh, on situations in a number of councils and actually wrote to a number of councils uh, and uh, was looking um, at the guidance around about the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, if uh, Ms Baker has any specifics uh, that she would like to raise, uh, I'm quite sure that the new Cabinet Secretary uh, will look at that. Um, but I can assure Ms Baker um, that Ms Freeman was definitely looking at this uh, as, uh, in her uh, previous portfolio. Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Universal Credit was rolled out in Stirling last year and it has resulted in increased rent arrears, increased food bank referrals and increased risk of homelessness. Clearly, the Scottish Welfare Fund is under a lot of pressure to try and mitigate the uh, heartless approach that we see from the UK government over social security. But can I ask what further action can the Scottish government take, particularly with Stirling Council, to support local authorities, to support the communities who have been crushed by these welfare reforms? Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, continuing austerity uh, will result in an overall reduction in annual welfare spend of £4 billion in Scotland by 2020 um, and the Scottish Government are spending over £125 million in 2018-19 on welfare mitigation uh, and measures to help those on low incomes uh, from those changes that have been imposed by the UK Government. Um, this is over £20 million uh, more than in previous years. Um, uh, Ms Constance uh, wrote to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Esther McVeigh, on the 15th of June 2018, calling again for the rollout to be halted. Uh, we believe that universal credit is flawed, and until they get it right, uh, they should halt um, the rollout of this flawed policy. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Is the Minister aware of any councils underspending the Scottish Welfare Fund allocation? and what can be done to encourage councils to actually make the most of this vitally important fund? Uh, President Officer, the Government are aware of uh, 11 councils. Uh, they underspent their Scottish Welfare Fund allocation by £30,000 or more. Uh, these councils were East Ayrshire, City of Edinburgh, Falkirk, Fife, Highland, Inverclyde, Murray, Scottish Borders, Shetland Island, South Ayrshire and South Lanarkshire. Uh, the Scottish Welfare Fund is a vital lifeline for families and individuals across Scotland and I agree that it is absolutely crucial uh, that councils are encouraged to make the most of this fund, especially given the welfare reform cuts being imposed uh, by the UK Government. Uh, the Scottish Government itself publishes statutory guidance on an annual basis which requires local councils to manage the fund in a, a way which helps those folks that are most in need in their local area. Uh, and we also hold quarterly practitioner forums, which all councils attend to promote best practice and address issues such as take-up. Mark Griffin. Thank you. 
Um, Minister, similarly, there are local authorities who exhaust their welfare fund allocation, and there are people in uh, desperate need who would qualify for a grant from the welfare fund and don't get it simply because of the time of year they happen to fall into hardship. I wonder what the Scottish Government thinks of the fairness of that and if uh, the Minister would propose any, taking any steps to make sure that those who are in desperate need of that support don't miss out just because of the time of year. Minister. Um, President Officer, um, as Mr Griffin is well aware, uh, Ms Freeman kept a close eye on all of these matters. Uh, since April 2013, £38 million pounds per annum has been allocated to local authorities uh, for the Scottish Welfare Fund, uh, and we are committed uh, to keeping uh, that fund. Uh, Mr Griffin will also be aware from previous answers uh, from Ms Freeman uh, that the basis of distribution to local authorities uh, changed in November 2015. Uh, this followed a recommendation from the Settlement and Distribution Group uh, and was agreed by COSLA leaders and Scottish ministers. Uh, this was phased in from 2016-17. Uh, uh, and distribution of the welfare fund is now wholly informed by the income domain of the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation uh, to help support the most vulnerable in our communities. Uh, the new Cabinet Secretary here is listening, uh, and I'm sure um, that uh, she will keep a close eye on all of this too. And if there are any specifics that Mr Griffin uh, wants to share, I'm sure we, she will respond positively. Question number two, Miles Briggs. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce loneliness and isolation amongst older people. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. In January, Ms Freeman published Scotland's first national strategy on social isolation and loneliness uh, anywhere in the UK for consultation. Uh, we have consulted with a range of groups including older people and organisations like Age Scotland and the Scottish Seniors Alliance have been active in contributing to this. The Older People Strategic Action Group that, I that Ms Freeman established last year discussed the strategy at a previous meeting. Uh, we're also taking action, um, our £500,000 Social Isolation and Loneliness Fund in 2016-17 uh, supported a number of local initiatives across Scotland uh, which have provided support for older people and other vulnerable groups. And our work to deliver more accessible housing, tackle poverty, promote employment and volunteering opportunities, maintain concessionary travel and reform adult social care all helps ensure that older people are able to live their lives to the fullest and maintain their important social connections. Miles Briggs. For that answer, and can he perhaps give an indication of any additional measures um, which will be contained in the final A Connected Scotland strategy? Specifically, how is the strategy looking to support the fantastic work of voluntary organisations um, such as those in my own region of uh, Vintage Vibes, Health in Mind, and Contact the Elderly to enable them to expand their services that they offer? Minister. Um, President officer, I am aware of some of the um, uh, groups that Mr Briggs has uh, mentioned in his question there, including uh, Vintage Vibes, which is in Mr Gordon MacDonald's constituency at the Broomhouse Centre. I know that Ms Freeman uh, paid close attention uh, to that um, and a, a number of other organisations uh, across the country. Um, I, the government will continue uh, to listen uh, to these groups. Um, social isolation is uh, one of these things that we are determined to tackle. Uh, and I was very pleased myself to um, visit Dundee City Council uh, quite recently, um, where their social isolation uh, teams were based with their energy efficiency teams, their homeless teams, uh, and their welfare benefits teams. I think it's very important that local authorities look to bringing these services together so that we can provide our very best uh, for those folks out there who may feel isolated. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree that befriending services such as those run by quarriers in North Ayrshire can deliver great benefits, including improved confidence and well-being to people experiencing loneliness and indeed those who befriend them? And if so, how does the Scottish Government plan to encourage and support such initiatives? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I pay tribute to uh, the important work that organisations uh, like quarriers do. Um, I think that befriending services like these are often uh, a vital lifeline to those who are most at risk of social isolation and uh, loneliness. Not everyone needs them, 
uh, but for those that do, uh, they play a, a vital role in supporting ind individuals to build up their social networks, spend quality time with another person, and to participate in activities um, that they might otherwise not have the opportunity uh, to do. Uh, I know that for many uh, people who have been uh, the befriender, uh, their own life has been enriched both by the individual relationships uh, with their befriendee and by the opportunity to give back to their community. So I would say more power to the elbow of quarriers and other organisations uh, like it. Monica Lennon. Thank you. The government strategy on loneliness acknowledges the importance of libraries uh, and notes government investment in the public library improvement fund. I wonder if Jean Freeman kept a close eye on recent figures provided by the Scottish Library and Information Council because they show that a total of 30 libraries closed in Scotland last year, up from 15 the year before. Does the Minister agree that these closures will have a negative impact on community cohesion and how does the government plan to prevent further closures of public libraries in future? Minister. I thank Ms Lennon for her question. I had the great pleasure of being in the uh, south of Edinburgh um, this morning at the community hub there which incorporated the library um, and I think that Edinburgh has done very well in incorporating these uh, community facilities together um, which not only saves money but brings services together that, so that people uh, can access those services in one place. Um, as Ms Lennon is well aware um, as a former uh, local councillor uh, like myself it is up to local authorities themselves to make the decisions uh, around uh, about libraries. Uh, while I was serving in Aberdeen uh, in an administration, uh, I ensured that there were no library closures, and I think that many other lo local authorities should try and do likewise. Mike Rumbles. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, does the Minister recognise that the government's own free bus travel for the over 60s helps many people overcome loneliness and isolation? Um, at the moment, should we not be promoting this scheme rather than considering restricting it? And if he does agree with me, would he mention it to the new transport minister? Um, I know I said I was going to answer a fair amount of questions across the portfolio this <laughs> afternoon, uh, presiding officer, but I didn't expect uh, questions on transport. Um, the concessionary fare scheme itself uh, has been uh, kept by uh, this government. Uh, obviously, there has been an ongoing review. Uh, the positivity of uh, concessionary fares um, is beyond doubt, um, and I'm sure that the new Transport Minister uh, will report back to Parliament after uh, the findings uh, of the consultation is complete. Question number three, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the report by Crisis Everybody In, How to End Homelessness in Great Britain, published 2018. Minister. Um, I welcome the recent report from Crisis and the work of its chief executive, John Sparks, who chairs our Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group. I'm pleased that the report recognises the Scottish Government's strong commitment to tack tackling homelessness and highlights some of the strides we have already made. For example, noting that we have set the highest standard in limiting the use of unsuitable temporary accommodation in the UK. Uh, the crisis report highlights the challenges around homelessness and the need for us all to do more. That is exactly why we established the action group last year, to help us identify the solutions to homelessness, and I welcome the recommendations they have published, including the final set in their report today. Bob Doris. Uh, Minister, as you know, the report's a weighty document, substantial recommendations contained within it. However, let me pick just the first one, to introduce a statutory duty to prevent homelessness for all households who are at risk of becoming homeless within 56 days, regardless of priority status, local connection, intentionality or migration status. As the MSP for Mary Hill and Springburn, I occasionally have constituents at imminent risk of homelessness, including elderly residents told to turn up at homeless services a couple of weeks before they are homeless or worse still, once they are on the streets. Can I ask the Minister to act on the recommendation contained within the report that I have highlighted and monitor practice across local authorities to ensure its appropriate implementation? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank Mr Doris for his question. Um, as I say, I welcome the, re the report from Crisis and the work of John Sparks. Um, whilst we have uh, strong rights for homeless households and we've made much pr progress on preventing homelessness in recent years, uh, we're determined to do much more 
uh, to make a step change in people's experience of housing and homelessness in Scotland. And that is why we have accepted in principle uh, all of the action group's recommendations, including examining the case for introducing a comprehensive homelessness prevent prevention duty on local authorities and on other uh, local public bodies. Um, we have committed uh, to working with our partners across a, a range of sectors to bring forward a programme of work to take forward the recommendations. I know that Mr Doris has been keeping a very close eye on this uh, and I'm sure that he will continue to scrutinise the government as we go forward on this front. Annie Wells. Thank you. Statistics last week showed that the number of homelessness applicants formerly in the armed services in Scotland increased by 11% between 2016-17 and 2017-18. As housing is a devolved issue, what action has been taken by the Minister to ensure that veterans who serve our country are being supported once they leave the armed services? Uh, well, I would pay tribute to Keith Brown in his role as Minister for Veterans um, in the uh, last government. Um, as uh, It would be fair to say that he kept me on my toes in terms of dealing uh, with veterans' issues. Um, and the government itself has provided uh, funding to um, the Garden City project, for example, to provide uh, uh, housing for veterans. Um, I would say what would be helpful um, is if the Ministry of Defence actually helped us in terms of uh, land and housing that it has in Scotland, which would help alleviate uh, some of the difficulties uh, that we face here. Uh, I know that Mr Brown was assiduous on this, uh, particularly in his discussions around about the Stirling and Clack Manager City deal. Um, and in order for us to get this right, uh, I, I would be very grateful if Miss Wells could talk to the UK government as well uh, to see if they can be a bit more positive uh, in allowing transfer of land and housing from the Ministry of Defence so that we can do more uh, for our veterans. Question number four, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when the Minister for Local Government and Housing last met Eastern Bartonshire Council and what issues were discussed. Minister. Uh, President officer, ministers and officials will regularly meet representatives of all local, uh, Scottish local authorities, uh, including Eastern Bartonshire Council, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. Neil Bibby. I would suggest that the Minister meets Eastern Martinshire Council promptly because the Minister will be aware that GMB, Unison and Unite Trade Unions have taken understandable and unprecedented strike action against Eastern Martinshire Council after a sustained attack on the conditions of some of their lowest paid council workers. The Lib Dem Tory coalition running the council have put forward proposals to cut annual leave, scrap overtime allowances and reduce redundancy benefit to the lowest level of any Scottish local authority. Will the Minister unequivocally condemn the administration at Eastern Martinshire Council? And will, well, it is not an excuse for the Council for their conduct, will the Minister also accept that this attack on workers' rights is also driven by austerity, austerity this SNP Government has intensified and passed on to Scotland's councils for far too long? Minister. Um, I think Mr Bibby spoiled his question at the end. If he wants to point the finger about austerity, he should be pointing the finger at the UK government who have slashed the budget of, of this Scottish government. Um, as Mr Bibby uh, well knows, um, this dispute is between the councils and employer and the unions representing its staff. Councils are independent uh, of the Scottish Government uh, and ministers uh, do not have legal powers to intervene in such matters. However, we regret any action uh, that disrupts schools and other public services uh, and we would encourage all parties to resolve the dispute quickly uh, without further disruption for the residents of Eastern Bartonshire. Rona Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. The SNP group on Eastern Barnetshire Council resigned from leading the council after losing the vote when opposing this assault on workers' terms and conditions. Does the minister agree that administrations who ride roughshod over union members and workers' rights should be condemned in the strongest terms? Um, as I said to uh, Mr Bibby, the dispute is between the council as an employer um, and uh, the unions representing uh, the staff of Eastern Barnetshire Council. Um, as members are aware, 
uh, councils are independent of the Scottish Government uh, and it is for locally elected representatives to resolve these disputes. I have no powers to intervene uh, on these matters but I would reiterate again uh, that I think that uh, the council uh, as the employer and the union should get round the table uh, to resolve this situation to ensure uh, that the people of Eastern Bartonshire are, are served well. Question number five, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I, I know we now have a statement on this coming up imminently, but can I ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle the recent rise in homelessness? Yes, sir. Uh, Presiding Officer, it's not acceptable in a country like Scotland for people to be rough sleeping or spending extended uh, periods of time in temporary accommodation. And that's why we established the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group and have set up, to 50 million, uh, set up the £50 million pounds Ending Homelessness Together Fund to dr drive sustainable and lasting change to tackle homelessness in Scotland uh, and to make rough sleeping a thing of the past. Uh, this morning, the Action Group published its fourth report uh, and its final set of 29 recommendations about ending homelessness, which the G Scottish Government has accepted in principle. Uh, we look forward to implementing the Action Group's recommendations and moving towards ending homelessness in Scotland for good. Can I thank the uh, Minister for uh, his response. For the first time in, in nine years, the number of homelessness applications has risen. Uh, for example, in my own region, in Perth and Kinross, there was a 17% spike in the number of homelessness uh, applications over the past year. And as the Minister said, there's been a rise in the number of households and children sleeping in temporary accommodation. In terms of the action plan uh, that the Minister referred to, can he tell us specifically what uh, headline action will tackle this problem and will there be additional resources available to local authorities who have seen a, a particular rise in terms of uh, homelessness problem? Um, I find it always rather surprising that the Conservative benches uh, talk about spending more money uh, when they were the party that wanted to slash £550 million from our budget by giving tax cuts to the rich. Um, I, I think uh, we have seen a situation uh, for the first time in a decade where we've seen a 39% drop in homelessness applications here in Scotland, we have seen a, a rise. Um, I uh, have to say that that is regrettable, uh, but one of the reasons why uh, we are seeing that rise, and we hear this from third sector partners and from the likes of the National Audit, Audit Office, is uh, because these uh, things are being driven uh, by the Tory government's welfare changes. Things like the benefit cap, uh, sanctions. Um, Mr. Mr. Fraser shites from uh, a sedentary position, somebody else is to blame. Well, in this case, the Tory government is very much to blame, and I, they should rethink all of their welfare policies and put people first. Richard Lyle. Yes, thank you, President Officer. Does the Minister accept the National Audit Office conclusion that the rise in the number of homeless families in the UK is likely to have been driven by the UK Tory government's welfare changes? Minister. Well, I'm glad that uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Lyle, like myself, has read the National Audit Office report, which is pretty damning. Um, so, yes, I agree with him. The Scottish Government believes that the UK government welfare policies are limiting access to affordable accommodation uh, for those on low incomes and as such is increasing the risk of hardship and homelessness. Um, the Scottish Government recently published a, a report on the impact of welfare reform on housing uh, and found that in uh, the private and social sector, households have been severely affected uh, by the UK Government's welfare policy. The report highlights the negative effect of universal credit on both tenants and landlords due to the major increase in rent arrears. In East Lothian, for example, 72%, 72% of social housing tenants claiming universal credit were in arrears compared to 30% of all te tenants. This is down to universal credit. This is down to these welfare changes. And it's about time the Tories recognised the damage that they're doing to people across the country. Question six, Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government what impact it anticipates the rollout of universal credit will have on people in the Renfrewshire South constituency. Minister. Uh, President Officer, the UK Government's planned rollout of universal credit full service in Renfrewshire 
in September 2018 is unfortunately likely to result in increased debt, hardship and rent arrears and push people into crisis and at risk of homelessness as that is what we have seen in other council areas as I've just said. The Trussell Trust explicitly links the rise in the use of food banks to the rollout of universal credit. It found that food bank use increased by an average of 52% in UC full service areas. Evidence provided by COSLA also suggests that average rent arrears for those in receipt of UC are more than 2.5 times higher than those on housing benefit. Uh, the Scottish Government has now written to Esther McVeigh for the sixth time in two years, calling on the UK Government to halt the rollout of universal credit. However, Esther McVeigh's statement to the House of Commons on 21st of June suggests that our plea continues to fall on deaf ears. Tom Arthur. President Officer, I have had far too many constituents come to my surgery in tears as a result of the UK Government's welfare reforms and their sanction regimes. Does the Minister agree with me that the recent National Office, Audit Office report on the rolling out of universal credit is a damning indictment of the Tory UK Government's handling of the, be of the benefit system? But it's further evidence that Westminster cannot be trusted to look after the most vulnerable. And yet another reason why this Parliament should have the full powers of a normal, independent country. Minister. Um, I agree completely and utterly with Tom Arthur that this uh, Parliament should have full powers over Social Security. Every day, every day, uh, we are hearing further evidence about the misery that Universal Credit and other benefits like ESA and PIP are causing. Continuing austerity uh, will result in an overall reduction uh, in annual welfare spend of four billion pounds in Scotland by 2020. Uh, this is in stark contrast to the way uh, we will deliver social security in Scotland. We are putting people first and treating them with the dignity and respect that everyone has the right to expect um, from their social security system. Uh, we expect to spend over £125 million pounds in 2018-19 uh, on welfare mitigation uh, measures to help the most vulnerable people here in Scotland. Uh, that's over £20 million pounds, uh, uh, than uh, that spent in previous years. But the key thing in all of this is that the Tories should rethink their policies of austerity and roll back on these nonsensical benefit cuts. Question number seven, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many affordable homes it plans to build in Inverclyde with local housing associations by 2021. Minister. Uh, President Officer, over the course of this Parliament, 898 affordable homes are planned in communities across Inverclyde, uh, with locally based associations delivering 671 of these. This is backed by nearly £50 million pounds of investment from the Scottish Government. This investment will go towards meeting our ambitious target of delivering over 50,000 affordable homes by 2021, backed by £3 billion pounds of investment. And I'm delighted to say that since 2007, we have delivered over 76,500 affordable homes across Scotland. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply and I welcome this uh, vast investment the Scottish Government uh, will be allocating to Inverclyde and how this will benefit many families and also the local community. But does the Minister agree with me, however, that alongside any new homes, both affordable and also private, the local authorities should consider when progressing their local development plans how they will be serviced with improved infrastructure to guarantee positive outcomes for these new developments and also residents? Minister. Um, I thank uh, Mr McMillan for that question. It is the responsibility of local authorities uh, to address these issues through their local development plans in accordance uh, with uh, Scottish planning policy and the national planning framework. Uh, the Scottish Government is uh, committed uh, to uh, promoting an infrastructure first approach uh, to the delivery of uh, development and to supporting stakeholders in this process. Uh, achieving better coordination of infrastructure, planning, delivery um, and the development plan process itself uh, is a key part of our ongoing planning review uh, and also a large part of our planning bill. Question number eight, Linda Fabiani. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet the UK Government Ministers responsible for Social Security. Uh, the Minister. next formal meeting between Scottish Government and UK Government ministers 
is the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare uh, scheduled to be held on Monday the 10th of September. Uh, the previous meeting took place in Edinburgh on the 14th of June. Uh, in addition, uh, Angela Constance and Jean Freeman uh, have had contact with the Secretary of State for Scotland, uh, the Secretary of State for the Department of Works and Pensions and the Minister for Disabled People, Health and Work. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. May I ask that at the next available opportunity, Scottish ministers raise with UK ministers the question of the removal of both enhanced and severe disability premiums from universal credit. And could they ask them to explain why the UK government thinks it acceptable that a constituent of mine, registered disabled, will lose more than £200 a month when transferred to universal credit, despite the so-called transition protection payment. Minister. Um, President Officer, I thank Ms Fabiani for her question. I know that um, Ms Freeman uh, has written twice to the UK Government regarding this issue uh, on the 21st of March and the 16th of May this year, um, sharing our serious concerns over the loss of income uh, that disabled people are having to endure uh, when they are moved to universal credit. Uh, the lack of transitional protection for people moving into, onto, use, onto uh, universal credit is completely and utterly unacceptable. And even the UK government has now recognised this, but its offer of backdated uh, transitional protection will be of little comfort uh, to those that have had to live with the impact of missed premiums on their incomes and living standards. On the 7th of June uh, this year, in a written statement, Esther McVeigh confirmed that the DWP uh, would provide uh, transitional protection for people in receipt of the disability premiums. Draft regulations recently published by the DWP have given some information about the plans uh, for that transitional protection. Uh, but not only have people missed out on the premiums when they've moved to universal credit, but many thousands of people uh, who should have been entitled to the premiums uh, when initially making that switch uh, to ESA from incapacity bene benefit have not been receiving them due to administrative errors from the DWP. Um, I know that Ms Freeman recently met with the Independent Living Fund Scotland uh, who shared with her some of the stories of people that helped to uh, who they've helped to receive uh, upwards of £10,000 of missing premiums. This is yet another disgraceful, shambolic situation uh, that the UK government uh, have actually uh, put in place and it is now time uh, for them to fix it so that the most vulnerable people in our society are protected and get the payments that they need and deserve. Thank you, Minister. Just, I know the Minister is trying to be helpful, but if you can direct his remarks to the Chair and through the microphone, everyone will pick it up, including the official report. Question number nine, Annie Wells. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackling hate crime. Yes, sir. Uh, President Officer, last year Angela Constance published an ambitious programme of work to tackle hate crime and build community cohesion. Uh, she also established an action group to take this forward. The action group is tackling a range of issues, including how to increase reporting, raise awareness and prevent hate crime from occurring. Uh, last October, uh, the government ran the successful Hate Has No Home in Scotland campaign uh, to raise awareness of hate crime and how to report it. And the government are carefully considering Lord Brackadale's important recommendations published on the 31st of May on hate crime legislation. Annie Wills. I thank the Minister for that answer. Figures released by the Crown Office this month show a massive spike in certain forms of hate crime. Since 2010-11, sexual orientation hate crime has increased by 146%, transgender identity hate crime by 250%, and disability hate crime by a shocking 1,100%. And I, of course, recognise that this is part due to increased reporting, but what action is the Minister taking to ensure these sorts of crimes are being tackled at the root and that real progress will be made? Minister. I think that uh, Ms Wells is right to highlight the fact that there may be increased reporting and that is a good thing. Um, however, we cannot be complacent on any of these issues. I have to say from a constituency perspective, uh, I was very per perturbed to see the rise uh, in hate crime uh, against LGBT plus people uh, in my own area. Um, and, you know, I, I uh, on a constituency capacity, uh, have been in touch with the police there to make sure that all is being done. 
Um, uh, Ms Wells can be assured that the government will look carefully um, at the important recommendations that have been put forward by uh, Lord Brackadale um, and our continued efforts. Uh... Point of order. Presiding officer, um, the Minister is referring to his constituency experience, but with respect, we are, a, we are in the Chamber to ask questions of the responsible Scottish Government Ministers. Presiding officer, it's my understanding that the vote on ministerial appointments does not take place until tomorrow lunchtime, and we find that the front bench is short of the Cabinet Secretary for this portfolio and the Minister for Social Security, which Mr uh, Stewart has already made reference to three or four times that she was dealing with these issues and not himself. I would ask, presiding officer, your guidance, is it not more respectful to Parliament that the ministers in charge of these portfolios show up to answer the questions? The member, has, the member has expressed her view. It is up to the government to decide which ministers should reply to parliamentary questions. In this case, the minister did make it clear from the outset that he would be answering all the questions, and he did actually ask for the chamber's indulgence at that point. Uh, is the minister finished her... Yes, exactly. The minister During, finished uh, Ms Wells' question. Um, if Ms Wells has any uh, specific points that she would like to make, um, then I'm sure that the new ministerial team uh, will be pleased to, uh, to look at that, uh, but she can be assured um, that this government will continue to have a zero tolerance policy uh, towards any hate crime. We would encourage people to report it uh, and we, we would encourage the authorities uh, to take action as uh, necessary uh, to deal with these despicable crimes. Question 11, Patrick Harvey. I ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to tackle discrimination and prejudice based on immigration status. Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, this month uh, we launched our uh, We Are Scotland campaign, which challenges attitudes um, around migration. Um, uh, I've outlined in my answer to Annie Wells and the range of steps we are taking to tackle hate crime. In addition, at the end of last year, uh, we published our new Scots refugee integration strategy, uh, which supports the vision of a welcoming Scotland and our race equality action plan, which is focused on ensuring better outcomes for ethnic minorities in Scotland. And we are clear that any form of discrimination or prejudice is completely unacceptable and will not be tolerated. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. In answer to the previous question, the, the Minister mentioned the Brackadale Review, which uh, concluded in, in paragraphs 4.72 to 76 that respondents had a clear view that there uh, was uh, offending uh, behaviour involving hostility to people on the basis of, of immigration status and that there was no central collection of data in relation to the immigration status of those victims of crime. Now, it didn't recommend a new statutory aggravation, and I can understand why. They say that it's already covered. But does the minister agree that we're not doing enough if we're failing to collect that data around the immigration status of people who are victims of crime that's motivated by prejudice on grounds of their immigration status? What is there short of introducing a new aggravation that the government can do to try and address that? Um, President officer, I'm not going to preempt the government's response to, the, uh, to Lord Brackadale's uh, recommendation. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary, I'm sure, will look at this um, in some depth and will report back to par Parliament uh, exactly what our responses are in that regard. Um, but could I reiterate again um, that this government has zero tolerance for any hate crime. Um, I think that a lot of what is going on out there um, has been fuelled by the UK government's uh, policies, including the hostile environment policy, uh, and uh, fuelled even more uh, by some of the uh, so-called newspapers uh, that try to blame uh, migrants for everything uh, when these people have come to our country uh, and have actually uh, done extremely well uh, in our society, um, earning uh, and living uh, amongst us and providing us I think, uh, with uh, added value uh, in our cosmopolitan Scotland, and long may that continue. Question 12, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it defines social enterprise for the purposes of providing public funding, support or other assistance to relevant organisations. Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, public, public funding is targeted in line with our strategic approach developed in partnership with the sector. 
Uh, broadly speaking, social enterprises are businesses that trade for the common good. Uh, they seek to make profits, profits but are committed to reinvesting these into a social mission. Uh, whilst there is no legal definition, the Scottish social enterprise sector has set down the values and behaviour by which they recognise a social enterprise. This voluntary code of practice recognises five basic criteria for social enterprises. Uh, the code is referred within the Scottish social enterprise strategy, co-produced between the Scottish Government and the social enterprise sector, uh, uh, which was launched in 2016 uh, and which sets out our shared priorities over the next 10 years. Dean Lockhart. Um, I thank the Minister for that response. As he indicated, there is no uh, legal definition of what constitutes a social, social enterprise in Scotland, and this has led to confusion for many enterprises operating in this area. So can I ask the Minister and the new Cabinet Secretary to look at measures to clarify the definition of social enterprise in order to address this confusion? Um, I, I'm sure that uh, the new Cabinet Secretary will look at that, but um, while uh, there is no legal definition, it has to be said um, that th that hasn't been a barrier to growth uh, in the sector. Uh, the 2017 Scottish Social Enterprise Census uh, recorded an additional 400 social enterprises operating in Scotland uh, compared to the number identified in the 2015 cens census. The sector itself in Scotland is thriving. Uh, and contributed £2 billion pounds to the economy in 2017. Uh, but we will look at uh, what Mr Lockhart has highlighted here today. Thank you. And that concludes portfolio questions. We're going to move on to another item of business involving the same minister. However, we'll just take a few seconds uh, for members to change seats.